Welcome to the WAP webinar on how will airport PPP market involved post COVID-19 outbreak. My name is Jean-Christophe Barth. I am uh, the executive director of WAP, the World Association of PPP Units and Professionals. And we're very pleased to host this first uh, webinar of the airport PPP chapter. WAP is the home for public-private partnership professionals. And we are a NGO. Uh, that is there to promote better practices for more sustainable and uh, resilient PPPs. And this is extremely important in these uh, days as we all are suffering from uh, um, a slowing down economy, especially in the airport PPP economy. Please make use of the Q&A box because this will guide the conversation and uh, will make the whole experience more interactive. Now, let me introduce you uh, our exceptional moderator uh, to kick off this first airport PPP chapter uh, webinar. Jacques Follin is the chair of the WAP airport chapter and is a member of the steering committee. He has in-depth experience about airport PPP market and has spent over 20 years as deputy CEO of Aéroport de Paris and CEO of the international development segment of Aéroport de Paris group. Bidding for PPPs around the world in more than 30 countries and developing airport PPPs uh, for the group in varied countries like China, Jordan, Mexico, Belgium, Mauritius, Croatia, Africa, Middle East, to name just a few. And I wish us a lively and enriching debate on this highly topical issue. And I'm pleased to hand over to Jacques Follin, who will moderate this inaugural chapter uh, roundtable. Well, no, thank you, Jean-Christophe. So just to introduce the, the WAP Airport chapter, the WAP Airport chapter aims at providing PPP units, PPP professional and investor, a unique platform to exchange on the actuality and the evolution of the airport public-private partnership market. This is the uh, first webinar of the WAP Airport chapter. So thank you for uh, attending this webinar. It will be uh, dedicated to the uh, future of uh, airport PPP post uh, um, COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has plunged the entire aviation sector into one of its deepest crises um, since a long time. And a majority of patient experiences experiencing, I'm sorry, difficulties in considering activity. This webinar aims at to imagine in when it will be possible to envisage a recovery in the airport PPP market and what forms these new PPPs could take in the light of the current experience with existing concession. The panel discussion, as Jean-Christophe uh, just said, will be in the format of a roundtable. The participants will be encouraged to use the question and answer tool to submit questions which will be answered by the panelists. And now I have the pleasure, the great pleasure to introduce you the, the five panelists of this webinar. Let's start to, with women first. Uh, Anke, Anke Enze is the director of the investment financing department of Yavia Alliance, uh, the former Altif Airport. She has over years of airport m &A experience gaining various buy side and sell side transaction. Anke, has also been involved in the syndication of the Budapest loan in 2007, the refinancing of Budapest Airport in 2017, and more recently in the Athens Airport concession extension in 2018. Just to introduce Avia Alliance, Avia Alliance is one of the world's leading private industrial airport investor. The company participates in airport privatization worldwide and acquires concessions. In its portfolio, Oh, you can see the airports of Athens, Budapest, Düsseldorf, Hamburg, and San Juan in Puerto Rico. And since uh, 2013, Avia Alliance has been a subsidiary of a PSP Investment, which is based in an investment fund based in Canada. Just to continue with Canada, uh, Curtis Grad. Curtis Grad is the chief executive officer and founding partner of Modalist Infrastructure Partners a strategic investment and professional advisory services company specialized in interna international transport infrastructure privatization, investment, development, and operation. During his more than 25 year, I'm sorry, Curtis, 25 uh, career in the uh, 
transport infrastructure sector. He has led extensive change management and redevelopment programs for various international airports and port facility worldwide, spanning Canada, Jamaica, Cyprus, Jordan, and Panama. A majority of these projects being developed under the form of public-private partnership. Let's uh, talk about Yves. Yves Lepage is a leading energy and infrastructure international lawyer. He currently serves as head of the Paris um, firm's infrastructure practice and head of Africa practice for Oric, Oric, I'm sorry, Oric Law Firm. With 30 years experience in the world of uh, peace, international infrastructure projects and power industry projects, Eve regularly advises operators in both public and private sectors, government entities, and financial institutions for operation in Europe, Africa, and Latin America. He has also wide and substantial experience in privatization and acquisition in France um, with company whose main assets are infrastructure facilities. Over the last five years, Eve has advised various airport operators in matters relating to concession in France, Greece, Serbia, Guinea, uh, Capo Verde, A, and privatization in Mexico, Benin, Nigeria, Burkina, and acquisition in Senegal, United States, Northern Ireland, Sweden, Costa Rica, Liberia, uh, Colombia and Jamaica. I'm sorry, I'm not going to read all the country over the world here, but I mean, it's an impressive experience. Alexander, Alexander Laid has over 15 years of international banking experience in both investment and advisory position with HSBC, Macquarie Capital, and at IFC, the International Finance Corporation, since 2009, where he covers the MENA region and is also for IFC. He, the in charge of the airport sector coverage. His aviation transaction experience includes public sector or safe side advisory for IPO type transaction, as well as PPP, I'm sorry, PPP concession type models, in addition to buy side airport advisory and investment mandates. And he is currently involved in free active global airport self side transactions. And uh, the last one, David Olivier, our former colleague within uh, Group ADP. David Olivier Tarak has been working in the infrastructure industry for over 19 years. He started his career at the French Treasury Secretary, overseeing for the French Ministry of Finance the activities of the Air France KLM Group, the activities of Group ADP for airports, and the one of the SNCF, the French Railway Operators. He joined the strategic consulting industry at Boston Consulting Group and Roland Berger, and then joined ADP Group 12 years ago to be successively as uh, deputy CFO and uh, deputy CEO of TAV Airports. When working for TAV, he, over, he was overseeing a network of 14 airports and their PPP arrangement, uh, um, handling um, more than 100 million passengers. Throughout his career, he has implemented a number of complex and structured m and and p 3 transactions in the airport industry. Today, he oversees group ADP activities in, Amer in the Americas, North and South, as managing director of ADP International America, and is currently based in New York. So thank you. I hope I've been uh, overseeing your, your extensive uh, career. Now let's start the, the webinar. And, and I would like first to to have a positive message. I think that the, the, with the acceleration of vaccination, we can expect that COVID-19 pandemic will end in the coming months. However, it may not look like that passenger traffic will immediately bounce back. So I would like um, Mr. and Mrs. panelists uh, to have your, your views of, on the situation. And let's start with Curtis. Curtis, you have uh, an eye on worldwide airport activity. Let me ask you a couple of questions in relation with this uh, recovery. The first one would be, when can we expect to regain sufficient visibility in aviation sector activity to restore a minimum of confidence to investors and lenders? And the second one will be, uh, will there be differentiated impacts on the sector rebound according to the types of traffic, the size of airports, and the geog geographical areas? Curtis, you have the floor. Thank you, Jacques, and I appreciate the opportunity to join the panel. Um, you know, I guess everything is going to be tied back to the resumption of traffic, and it, it'll be a slow, progressive uh, restart. I think as as the vaccine rollout continues, as you pointed out, but it's not 
it's not homogenous. It's going to be um, accelerating in different areas in different countries. But we, you know, we've already seen that domestic will come back first. That will uh, be followed by uh, pair to pair sort of uh, country activity where those two countries are approved or regions in some cases. But as that traffic starts to recover, you know, then you start to see the investor community looking back at the sector. But there's a lot of uh, confidence that needs to be rebuilt in the in the airport sector after uh, the last year, year and a bit. And, you know, I guess the, the real proof will be coming next week as to where the investor community is currently in terms of their view of the market. And uh, that is with the auction, the round six auction coming up in Brazil. So it's really the first post or um, current COVID sort of um, transaction activity. And it'll be interesting to see what the, uh, the results are there. The, um, the other side of it is that um, you know, the concessions themselves, the new ones coming, coming post COVID will look very different. They'll be uh, presumably more cautious initially. Uh, they'll be looking for uh, different conditions than what we saw prior to the pandemic. I think you'll see uh, more conservative multiples. You'll see a uh, stronger uh, sort of focus on force majeure events as we've seen. And it will, be, um, it will be, as I said, a cautious approach. That's sort of what I see in the next 12 to 18 months, but uh, the confidence will be rebuilt and I'm fully expecting that we'll see uh, a robust trade in airports again, um, but the new the new deals will be slow to come um, uh, in the next twelve to eighteen months. That's that's my view. Well, thank you, Curtis. Uh, Anke, Avialians has investment in Europe, in the U.S., and you are looking at other areas around the world, including in Asia, as I understood. Uh, how do you see the traffic recovery in those areas? Well, it's really um, different for every market is what we see. Um, I mean, um, in the US, um, it reflects what Curtis said, that domestic comes back quickest and the domestic market in, in the US has never been really down. So um, there's a continued activity and that uh, picks up quicker than um, what we would expect uh, for the international traffic that is still pretty low and will continue to be low. Um, I think uh, the, the most um, important factor that we see in Europe is that uh, Europe um, does not live up to its uh, potential. Uh, it could be one big domestic market or quasi-domestic market, but it's not. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, national uh, borders that uh, are now being re-erected, so to speak. And uh, so the European activity is very, very low compared to other markets and probably will continue to uh, be so as we see the, uh, yes, there is progress with vaccinations, but unfortunately the new um, mutations uh, uh, provide a bit of a, a backslide, I would say. Um, what is uh, encouraging uh, in order to be optimistic, as you suggested, is that uh, we see that the dem demand is definitely there. Um, small openings from the political side uh, re uh, result in very strong resurgence of demand. We saw that in, um, uh, for example, in Germany, when Mallorca opened up, uh, demand was back so quickly. Um, so that gives us a lot of hope, but I think it's, it's going to be short term difficult longer term, lots of confidence, I would say. Well, thank you very much, Anke. David Olivier, you're covering America's region for Group ADP. Group ADP. How do you see the uh, airport traffic recovery happening? Uh, are you coming? Well, I think uh, I, would, uh, I would definitely concur with Curtis and, uh, and Anke. I, I think uh, we're seeing in the US uh, the first effect of the, the vaccine being rolled out. Uh, We've seen it's the seventh week now that traffic has improved when, when you look at the TSA throughput ratios or, or, um, uh, or the capacity being brought online by, by airlines, uh, things are getting better. Having said that, I think we're seeing uh, a bifurcation between touristic traffic and uh, corporate travel, which uh, still remains uh, extremely differentiated. Um, leisure volumes are... Uh, right now lower than like 20% than what they were in, in 2019. So I think that gives a, a lot of hope. And as soon as some capacity is, is brought back online, we're seeing 
are pretty decent traffic volume and then pretty decent load factors. At the same time, corporate travel remains relatively uh, um, um, still um, relatively affected by uh, remote working and so on, and still 80% of what they were in, in 2019. So I think there's still a question mark on when, when corporate will um, actually uh, move back to, to the market. Uh, but there was a, a recent survey by uh, the Global Business Travel Association. They, they just surveyed their corporate travel buyers and um, about three quarters of them have declared that they would uh, resume non-essential corporate travel within a year. So I, I think it gives hope. Uh, so that's for the domestic. I think domestic will definitely bounce back uh, pretty robustly and quickly. People are desperate to travel. I think international will probably uh, be slower uh, uh, to, to recover for a simple political, sanitary, wh whatever immigration reasons, which is when, when you're, you have uh, X number of countries, you need to solve X, uh, uh, X uh, situations uh, on a bilateral basis uh, to harmonize uh, social um, uh, health policies and so on. And so that makes probably international traffic more uh, more slower to, to recover than, than the domestic traffic. But what we've seen in our portfolio at ADP is, 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 a, is a good sign of hope, on, on, at least on the domestic side. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, David Olivier. Just, I, I, I noticed that the pandemic has brought significant, significant changing in people's life. I mean, such as accelerating the digi digital transition or the awareness of sustainable development goals. Um, I would like to have your view, uh, Curtis, on, uh, on how do you see it is changing, affecting the airport model in areas such as traffic profile, traffic growth, aero, non-aero revenues, or other issues? Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Jack. I think, um, you know, there was a number of trends that were already starting prior to the pandemic that were accelerated. And, you know, we're, out of necessity, we're seeing a lot of point-to-point -point traffic. And, um, you know, the, the low cost carriers really started that trend many years ago, but I, and I'm curious to see how that's going to look um, as we emerge out of the pandemic and whether we see a retained sort of activity that is, that is more point to point rather than through hubs out of both efficiency and um, health measures as well. And it really remains to be seen whether these health, health measures that are being imposed on airports or implemented at airports will be a long term uh, phenomenon, much like um, after 9-11, all of the, the security requirements that were imposed are still with us today. It'll be interesting to see, you know, 24 to 36 months from now, whether those um, those measures are eased or whether they become part of a sort of long-term scenario for us. But that will also come to drive the airport planning. Whatever happens in terms of, um, you know, the um, the resilience of, of the operation, but the sort of leftover measures that may may follow us for years to come will also have an effect on our um, our commercial programs you know will will there be more time spent post security because there is more um, there's more screening or there's a longer um, processing time to get people through the process not just security but the the health checks etc so you can start to expect maybe there will be a shift in what you see post security that maybe there's more food and beverage maybe there's more areas and larger areas for food and beverage activities, and will that come at the um, at the expense, or will that be some sort of reconfiguration of retail as well? And and you know what kind of retail appetite will the tra the traveler have post pandemic? Uh, is there pent up demand for more for more purchasing, or is it going to be more subdued? These are all questions that can't really be answered today, but you know we'll have to see in the in the coming months. But the other thing that will be interesting is that a lot of these concessions haven't been terribly focused on the, the master concessions haven't been terribly focused on cargo. And, um, you know, I can think of at least one um, one example that I was involved in as a concession, although the uh, the cargo was a, uh, a pay, um, there was a payment element for the concession. Uh, there was no way for the concessionaire to earn revenue off of cargo. So I can see a lot of these um, you know, refocusing and, and maybe reconfiguration of existing concessions, but the new ones are going to start looking at different ways in which the concessionaire or the investor can develop their, their revenue streams. 
And I suppose there are a few other things that have emerged or really became high profile over the last three to four months that are completely unrelated to, um, to uh, the pandemic, but you know, they're definitely trends and developments to be considered. And this whole move towards uh, development of eVTOL as these micro airports that uh, you, know, you hear what's going on in Florida with uh, Ferrovial and, and others developing a network of, of uh, eVTOL airports. And will this be a different type of PPP where it's a collection of small micro airports in a network? In this case, they're looking at developing 10, 10 separate sites. So there's some really interesting things that are starting to evolve that are sort of overlaid over this um, emergence out of the, um, the pandemic and only time will tell, but, uh, but definitely what we knew before and what we know going forward will look radically different. All right. Thank you, thank you, Curtis. Well, I mean, nice to see that. Well, there, there will be new um, airport PPP schemes, new business models. So, well, I mean, we we there is a high appetite to to see what will be the future. David Olivier, do you share similar views, and do you see uh, uh, any impact on the on the airport PPP market? Oh yeah, I think uh, I definitely concur with with Curtis. Um, I, I think there were a lot of pre-existing trends, but that have just been accelerated by the COVID. I mean, just to name a few. And I think the consequences of those trends are going to be extremely deep for the travel industry. Um, just to name a few, I mean, just contactless technology. I mean, because of, uh, you know, health and sanitary measures, we, uh, um, we a, a lot of initiatives have been launched, but, but I think this is going very, very fast and very deep. If you just look at what is going on on the payments systems right now, in the US with PayPal, with Stripe and so on. I mean, there's not, not a single cafe in New York where you can't just simply pay with your, with, with your phone. So I think contactless technology is going to be, um, to impact a, a lot of, in a lot of ways, the way we interact with the infrastructure and, and with, with, uh, with, with uh, which uh, airports are actually handling passengers and interacting with passengers. Uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of um, FNB pre-order and payments. We'll see, uh, uh, we, we've seen obviously virtual events. Uh, they will reshape entirely, you know, the travel industry, the uh, uh, big corporate events uh, industry uh, and, and, and potentially affect dramatically um, the, um, um, the, 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 the corporate travel demand. Um, 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 Obviously, the advanced self-service and, and biometrics is going to be uh, uh, extremely important. And we're seeing more and more airlines going into, uh, not just for sanitary, uh, but, but mo most of all for, for uh, efficiency reasons to accelerate uh, uh, processing times and, and, and efficiency. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, robotics and automation now in airports, uh, not only for cleaning, but uh, also for processing. Uh, luggages and so on, social distancing tech, the use of you know cameras to 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 uh, to ensure a, a minimal social distancing, offsite processing. Even though it's probably um, something a, a long way to go, uh, but we're seeing some airports, especially in the Middle East, being pretty active in trying to promote a, a different airport experience. I mean, this concept of um, concentrating a lot of people in the same place. Uh, I think has has been questioned by by the crisis and the COVID, uh, in, in in different ways of uh, handling passengers might come up, uh, probably in, in the longer term, um, um, and and I think the lo the last one, which for me is very important and will impact dramatically the PPP market, is the ESG concern. I mean the sustainability concern because uh, not not only have we seen uh, plane shaming and and stuff like that, but uh, I think people have questioned why, why are we traveling so much? Why, why are we sending three people for a corporate meeting when we can actually do a Zoom? And, and I think for PPP uh, airport managers, uh, uh, the, the ESG perspective will become more and more something we have to cope with. We will, we will need to have uh, very proactive programs uh, to address uh, sustainability issues, to address uh, 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 green, more gr um, greener policies and uh, a better insertion of the airport within within their environment. Because I think it's going to be uh, more and more a question of uh, whether we can sustain long long term growth within the industry. So I guess uh, these are 
uh, the key trends which I'm seeing uh, impacting a lot of the PPP market uh, going forward. Well, thank you, thank you, David. I mean, major change to happen in the in the airport business model and the airport concession business model. Let, let, let's speak a little bit about the uh, the the appetite for uh, airport PPPs. Um, most of the financial investor in the infrastructure PPP market have chosen to re redirect their liquidities to other infrastructure markets less affected than the airport sector, less affected by the, the pandemic than the, the airport sector. And Avia Alliance is uh, supported by PSP, a fund widely listed in the airport industry, but also in other industries. Will PSP maintain their interest in the sector? I mean, how do you see the, uh, the uh, investor maintaining their interest in the sector? Yeah, uh, PSP, <laughs> uh, PSP uh, as a well diversified infrastructure investor, has been involved in the airport market since uh, 2013, actually. And they know that uh, times like these uh, can offer opportunities for investors who can take the long term view and uh, who can manage the risks. And uh, the feedback that we get from them is actually that they appreciate AV Alliance being involved as an operational platform with know-how and expertise who can work through the issues and risks, which has become even more important than it was before. And we can help PSP as a financial investor to get comfortable with it, that the risks are actually manageable and uh, what value is there in, in a certain opportunity. So uh, actually the, the fact that many investors do not invest in airports right now is more to do with that there are no airport opportunities, transactions. Um, the investors who actually own an airport, in my experience, uh, they don't want to sell if they don't have to because uh, they are afraid of not getting full value at this point in time. And um, that is kind of unfortunate for from a point of view of an investor with appetite like PSP and with capital to deploy. Um, then uh, that lower valuations, meaning lower prices, um, are more a theoretical consideration. So um, there's no transaction, so lower prices do not tend to materialize. That's been my experience actually from the last uh, global, uh, from the last crisis, the global financial crisis, where there were very few, if any, uh, transactions. And um, so um, I think that's more, um, that there are no transactions because others will not sell. PSP would like to buy, and I'm kind of sure that I'm not the only one who sees it this way, who would rather like to see more transaction right now, but unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Well, be positive. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, David Olivier, how do you see uh, investor behaving in your uh, in your area? I mean, I know that in the US, I mean, a lot of uh, funds are, are looking for investing in airports and on the, in the airports industry. So how in, do, are they yeah, still I, I think it's, it's, this is very interesting what's going on right now. And uh, there's, uh, one, one size doesn't fit all. And we're seeing significant transactions on the sub-sector level. Uh, when, when you look at the airports, we're seeing a lot of transactions on the cargo side, on some ancillary businesses, um, FBO as well, uh, with uh, the recent uh, mega transaction of, uh, of GIP and, and uh and Blackstone on, on Signature with the contemplated sale of uh, Atlantic Aviation. So I think it all depends. Uh, it's true that uh, on the one hand, there's a huge liquidity available and historically uh, infra funds have been extremely attracted by the, the, the interesting combination that airports have with, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of long-term option you have. You have growth, uh, but at the same time, you have downside protection. Um, and, and that, that is probably explains why, why a lot of appetite have, have been put on, on this uh, asset class. Having said that, I think the, the moment right now is, is not really suitable for sellers to, to sell because we are at a really a low ebb uh, with a lot of uncertainty on the traffic recovery. Uh, and so it's probably not the best moment for sellers to, to sell. And what, one of the uh, main reason for um, some airport authorities to sell assets, we, which was Re re revamping or restructuring their asset, renovating their asset, investing in new capacity has just vanished uh, for the time being because there's no more capacity or less capacity constraints. Uh, and so the necessity to fund big cap capital expenditure program has uh, been, been postponed at least for, for a few years. So the necessity to have the private sector being involved has also been postponed. Um, so I think as the airport investor, we would be extremely delighted if there were more 
uh, transaction in the pipeline, but the reality is uh, probably it's not the best moment right now. There's still a lot of uncertainty uh, as far as traffic recovery is concerned. Having said that, on the sub level, we're seeing a lot of activity. Cargo has been very, very active with the e-commerce. FBO has been pretty, uh, pretty active, especially in the US, which is the largest um, uh, FBO market in the world. Uh, and and uh, so it, it all depends, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that once the traffic has stabilized, the what has made the success of that industry will prevail and investor will, will definitely bounce back. Yeah, very positive. Thank you, David Olivier. Alexander, I mean, IFC is involved in many PPP projects worldwide. The, you've been in contact with a lot of investors. Did you notice any changes in the investor approach? Are they still uh, keen to invest in, in airports? Thank you, Jacques. So I think it's still early days, but I'm definitely very optimistic for at least for the medium long term. Um, and just building on what Anka was, was saying, I think the change that we've seen is less on the demand side or the appetite side in terms of projects, but more in terms of supply side and definitely on the on the sales side in terms of governments. Um, and investors we're speaking to are not certainly not less keen on the sector um, and in many cases are sensing opportunities to be made in more kind of unsettled environment in more opportunity opportunistic uh, manner um and i you know i think every every few weeks i get calls from uh, from um companies investors active in the sector saying you know we're looking at this market uh we're trying to find a you know um, a project to go into and it's just really lack of 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 supply um in terms of what we saw last year i think certainly there was a greater focus on refinancing restructuring of existing projects rather than new projects and certainly fewer greenfield projects and i think none of that would be a surprise uh, for anyone um, in terms of what people are looking at um, i think the focus on traffic projections will be a lot greater so i think gone on the days of the kind of hockey stick traffic projections and i think lenders will be a lot more cautious in terms of factoring in the the downside scenarios uh, again as was mentioned i think uh, the operating expertise side of things has become or will become even more important so i think back in the day um, you know, a key question that was asked was, do you have the operating exp experience? In recent years, it has morphed into more of, you know, how big of a check can you write, uh, unfortunately, in, in some respects. Um, and I think we'll perhaps go back to more reasonable, sensible um, way of doing things in terms of getting the oper operating expertise, which is really key for investors and for lenders to get comfortable with. Um, I think in terms of in terms of what looking forward, I think the crazy valuations or bid levels that we've seen in the past may come down. And I think investors will be a lot more selective and perhaps less oblivious to the fact that traffic risk is a natural risk, uh, which I think in some cases they were less aware of, um, of previously. Um, and in terms of you know, what investors are looking for, I think uh, you know, the lower revenue from, um, from fewer passengers um, and you know, to defend against future impacts similar to this, could lead investors to be a bit more creative in terms of how they generate non-error revenues, perhaps independent from, from passenger numbers. So I think you've seen some, some intelligent real estate strategies being developed by, by some operators. Uh, I can think of you know, examples like the Munich Airport Lab Campus, uh, where you're attempting to build real estate strategies which are offered to the surrounding regions and not just to the, uh, to the immediate airport traffic. Um, so all in all, I think the investment thesis is still very strong um, uh, for the airport uh, space. I think if you've just gone into a transaction or a deal just before COVID, then you may need to wait a few years to see how that investment pans out. Uh, but when you're looking at the kind of contracts that we look at in terms of 20, 30 year concession contracts, I think it's still very solid, as long as you can stay afloat in the, uh, in the immediate uh, term, term of it we've been facing. Okay, thank you very much, Alexander. Just just talking about the airport operators, which is a word that I, I've been involved in for many years. I mean, I, I've noted that cash reserves of major international operators seem to have been deeply affected by the, the crisis. Uh, David, uh, do you think that operators will continue to look actively for controlling position in airport PPPs, or will they look for minority position or even O&M contract with uh, pass to control options? Um, no, I, I think we are much more opportunistic. Um, I mean, as, as group, AD, as I'm working for a group ADP, and, and I think we've been extremely cautious with cash. Uh, you know, there's there's always this motto. I mean, you, you should definitely uh, 
try to raise cash when you can, not when you have to. Um, and, and I think this is what we've done, precisely issuing several rounds of bonds uh, to, to secure uh, our, our cash position. And, and, and our cash position is, is pretty sound. But obviously, in a very uncertain environment, we have to be not only selective, but very relatively cautious. Um, and so we, we definitely now try to leverage more uh, the available demand and, and, and partnerships with, uh, um, with funds, with infra funds, with PE funds uh, and, and other partners. But while uh, doing that, we, we really wanna still continue to have leverage on the operations uh, and, and, and we can make a difference as airport operators in, the, in a complex environment where uh, resiliency, operations, uh, effectiveness becomes even more important in a, in a turnaround situation. And, 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 and I think uh, um, um, investors definitely recognize the sort of value that airport operators can bring uh, in, a, in a PPP arrangement. So we are very, very uh, opportunistic. Uh, even an O&M contract is, is, is interesting for us. As, as, as long as we can make a difference, uh, of course, on the operation level and, and on the asset level. And, and of course, if there is ONM plus um, some, some options to uh, invest at a later stage, I mean, that's of interest to us. Uh, we, we operate a, a network of uh, 27 airports around the world. Uh, and we definitely recognize the value uh, that we bring, uh, the value of the network, the sort of scale we bring uh, to, to, um, um, to the airports that belongs to the network in terms of innovation, in terms of procurement, in terms of best practices sharing. Uh, and, and definitely investors recognize that and governments recognize uh, the sort of value that we can bring. Uh, it's not only just about investing a majority position, it's really more and more about the industrial expertise that you bring in, a, in an uncertain environment in a, and in a, in a in a, in a timing where you need to restructure the way you are handling passengers, the way you deliver service, and the way airports are performing. So I guess the ONM uh, component uh, becomes um, a, a, an even more important aspect of, of the PPP. Uh, and, and we've seen, obviously, the, the, the Brazilian uh, privatization round that is uh, about to be uh, auctioned in, in next week. Uh, is, is, uh, has put more constraints uh, uh, on having a minimal uh, share of uh, airport operators being involved. And I think it's a good sign that, uh, you know, government are recognize, recognizing that, uh, you know, we bring value to, um, um, to, to the way airports are, are managed. Well, thank you. Thank you, David Olivier. Hank, uh, how do you see the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the airport, airport operator role? Well, I fully agree with David Olivier um, about the active role of the um, operator investor. Um, I mean, something that may have been forgotten um, during the boom times up until 2000, beginning of 2020, but airports have never been the kind of investment where you could just um, buy a participation, put it on a shelf and look at the monthly or quarterly report. Um, you need it and you still need to be actively involved there's always something going on, either good, so an expansion to be built or something bad, a crisis to be managed, um, but uh, this uh, will definitely continue. Um, what I think may um, be refocused a little bit is operational leverage, so the balance between fixed and variable costs. Um, I mean, airports are commonly known to be fixed cost investments, and that's certainly true up to a or not, uh, not only true, but unavoidable uh, to a certain extent, you need to build a runway, the taxiways, the terminals, and that is a huge upfront cost for sure. But um, looking beyond that to the day-to-day -day operations, I, I expect people to look more closely at what they need to do in-house and make it fixed cost and what they can outsource and make it variable cost. And um, the airport uh, may want to reconsider uh, the, or concentrate on the landlord type operate, uh, operations, meaning uh, be the one who organizes the whole thing, who makes sure that the services are delivered in the quality at the time that they are needed, and then um, just make sure that everything works, everything's functioned, but it doesn't need to be um, done by the airport, and make, that, will, that will make the airport organization much more uh, lean, much more flexible, and much more able to uh, be resilient in a situation like this, is, is my understanding. 
Okay, thank you, Alexander. Do you share similar view? You're in contact with many operators. Uh, do you share similar view about the role and the uh, the the investment size of the uh, of the airport operator in uh, PV, airport PVPs? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, I think you know operators had a, a tough time, but I think from a liquidity standpoint, both on the on the spend point of view, they managed to to take many measures, that, whether it's on the on the operating costs or the capex deferrals or the debt renegotiations or the government support programs or on the dividend payment side. Um, so that's that certainly helped on the cash inflow. I think, as I mentioned, on the refi aspects, um, raising new equity. Uh, so I think. You know, they, they managed to, to improve their liquidity positions, to put them in a strong position. Um, I think the role, as was mentioned, the role of operators uh, going forward in terms of, you know, getting us through these uh, kind of stormy waters is going to be even more critical, um, especially when I talk, I'm talking about, uh, you know, sell side government concessions. Um, I think we're often very keen and, and this is echoed by our government clients in terms of wanting um, you know, a very um, well laid out role for the operator element in any consortium. Uh, so this is not purely a financial driven uh, process. Um, the operator needs to have a, a minimum stake um, and, you know, certain commitments on the operator as well. Um, so I think that role is going to become even, uh, even, more, even more important to ensure that the, the assets, uh, which as was mentioned, are not just investments you put on the shelf, but really things that are evolving continuously and I think in order to protect these assets from you know, the future crisis that we may be facing, the operator role is even, even, even more critical. Um, and I think the, in terms of the operator uh, kind of behavior, I think also the dialogue between um, airports and the operators and the airlines may also need to, be, may also need to change. I think to more, uh, a more collaborative approach, I think in, in some instances. So obviously the airlines our, our key, key point, key customer of the airports. I think in some cases it works well, in other cases a bit less well. Um, I think when it comes to being lean and flexible on the airport side, I think that dialogue in terms of, especially in terms of advanced planning on the, on the CapEx side, in terms of operational side, uh, that di dialogue in some, some instances will need to be improved on. Well, thank you, Alexander. You know, in the in the in the airport uh, PPP market, you have the investor, you have the operators, you have uh, uh, the government, and, and and you have also the lenders. And, and, and the attitude of the lenders uh, as key players in the PPP airport market would like to be uh, well um, uh, scrutinized a little bit. I mean, Anka, how do you see the lenders behaving? Uh, could we imagine an impact on debt size and margin? What can we expect? What may be the consequences for investors and operators on equity size and equity returns? Well, I think um, right now it's a bit early to say um, how the debt terms will change in the medium to long term, especially for longer term financings or for large scale um, capex and acquisitions. Uh, because right now I think the focus is still pretty much on um, making sure that uh, the liquidity situation is, is right. So it's uh, really focused on working capital and making sure that to stay in the, um, in the with, or to work with a picture from the airport world to make sure that the runway is long enough um, that you stay afloat during this crisis and come out at the end um, in, in the best shape that you can possibly be. What we find though with the banks is uh, lenders appreciate transparency they uh, appreciate being kept in the loop, close communication and openness. And uh, they want to see the shareholders involved. They want to see that the uh, shareholders stand by their assets. And then they are quite supportive, even during an unprecedented crisis like this. That's what we find. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anke. Alexander, uh, IFC is also a lender. I know it's not directly your, your area, but uh, how do you see uh, DFI behaving? How do you see them? Uh, do do are still interested in, in investing? Do you see they are still interested in uh, in uh, in supporting the uh, the airport PVP sector? So Jacques, I think as Anka mentioned, you know we're still in early days, but I'm going to say something that may surprise you. But on average, I think in most years we do maybe a couple of deals on the lending side. I think this year we're looking at closing free transactions. And we're advanced stage on, on a few more. Uh, the majority, surprisingly, are more corporate loans at the whole co level rather than project finance to specific assets, uh, which is a bit new uh, to us. 
Um, but next year is also looking very promising. I think we have a higher demand than we've seen in, in past years. Um, so again, strong appetites. I think, you know, we at IFC and other DFIs, our role is to be a bit counter cyclical. Uh, so we're definitely in a certain cycle today. Um, and we, I think we're very, very keen to, to get involved. On the, on the sales side, uh, structuring side, um, I think there've been delays to existing projects, um, but still moving in some cases. And uh, we have a number of other new projects coming under discussion. So when we're talking about supply of, of projects through the pipeline, I think in, in the next year or two, we should see some interesting transactions coming through. So I think there has been some pullback more generally from commercial lenders. Uh, but good assets are getting funding at attractive rates. Um, we had uh, Sofia Airport that closed, you know, end of the year. Um, we saw, uh, I think, for Airport that we raised close to half a billion for Lima Q3 last year. Uh, it also, for Airport also managed to raise financing at uh, pretty pretty decent rates for 1.2 billion uh, euro um, fundraising. Um, and as I think was mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, you know, the upcoming Brazilian auctions should be another good test in terms of uh, on more on the, on the sponsor side in terms of their appetite. Um, so I think COVID, you know, in the short term uh, may have had an effect, but long wise, long term wise, I don't think it will fundamentally change things. Um, and as I mentioned, at least for IFC and other DFIs, it still remains a very attractive uh, sector uh, going forward. Um, I think on the, you know, one change is certainly going to be around the more fantasy projects. Uh, which existed in the pipeline previously. I think those have been wiped off the slate. Uh, so, uh, you know, the white elephant projects that were, were, were around, uh, we'll, say, we'll see how long it takes for them to come back. But certainly right now, people are being a lot, a lot more realistic in terms of the kind of projects um, uh, being looked at. And again, uh, I think another going forward, uh, and as was mentioned, and perhaps a, a topic for another discussion is longer term, the impact of climate change is something that we need to be looked at and how we approach these, approach these projects, sorry, from a, from a mitigation standpoint will be, will be an interesting uh, aspect to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. I mean, David Olivier, in a couple of words, I mean, do you see similar situation in North and Latin America for PV market? The... Yeah, I, I continue to see some, some appetite, even though uh, lenders are obviously more focused on downside, on the downside risk and, and the speed of recovery. We're, we're seeing, um, 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 I mean, conditions that have slightly worsened with uh, obviously more um, corporate support, which is asked uh, to, to sponsors, uh, especially in our, uh, early phases of projects where we're seeing um, um, higher um, debt su sustainability ratios. Uh, uh, you know, in this industry, you, you had, we, we were used to 1.30, 1.35, and we're seeing slightly worse uh, ratios now. But having said that, what we're seeing right now in the US with a lot of airport authorities uh, having tapped into the market with a huge rounds of uh, refinancing uh, on the bond market, which I think is a good sign of the appetite of the investor, the lenders uh, for, for the, the, the sort of credit quality that uh, airports have over the long term. So I'm, I'm it's, it's probably easy uh, early to say. Uh, we've seen some tightening of, of conditions, uh, but I, I, I'm pretty optimistic uh, in terms of appetite over the long term uh, for the industry. Thank, thank, thank you, David Olivier. Just I, I'd like now to, to talk about one, one important point, which is the, uh, the uh, airport, I mean, uh, PPP contract structure. I mean, we've seen that most of the protections that are offered by contracts have shown limits during the pandemic. Um, what are the difficulties of the shortcomings encountered? I mean, how can we invent, envisage remedying to this future in the, in the future contract? Can we see flexibility in the concession duration, uh, changes in force measure clause, uh, traffic uh, guarantees, flexibility in investment plans? I don't know what. I mean, if You've been involved in many, many, many concession contracts, and you have been assisting investors in implementing contract protection. How do you see potential evolution of these contracts? Thank you, Jacques. Uh, basically, we have a number of contracts. First of all, obviously, contracts that exist today, I think they are going to be very difficult to change. So what we have seen uh, in the last few months is the use of usual clauses, such as force majeure, 
uh, or other clause whereby the uh, concessionaire is trying to gain time, basically. Uh, we have also for new contract, uh, in the existing concession agreement, you have all those clauses already. And what we have seen over the years is that um, the government have been more and more greedy, quote unquote, in terms of trying to squeeze as much as possible the investors. And the investors, because of the strong strength of the market, the investor agreeing to clauses, uh, which I think today they will not agree to. So what we have, my view is that in the future, we are going to use all those clauses that exist. I mean, for instance, the payment of concession fees, the investment uh, and other clauses like that, whereby we are going to link, I think all those clauses to set an event. Also, what I think is going to happen, obviously is there going to be negotiation, specific negotiation on specific COVID clauses so that when you have a situation which is a very specific situation, you can address that situation in the contract. Let me add that even if you have those clauses, this pandemic is so huge and the effects are so important that you can put anything in a contract. At the end of the day, this is going to be a negotiation between the government and the sponsors and the investors. And what happened, I mean, you can see what happened in a number of countries yeah. where they have used not only the contract, but also they have been using other measures that are applicable to other industries that have been applicable to airport, such as, for instance, employment, where you have the government paying for salaries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, yes, this is a wake up call for the investors and for the government that are going to ease the negotiation in a way for the investors so that we have less stringent clauses that we had in the past. Well, thank you, thank you, Yves. I mean, Alexander, I mean, IFC is, com is, is IFC contemplating uh, to make a change in, in PPP contracts? Um, I don't know. I mean, you, 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 you've been uh, uh, working on many, many contracts and, and talking to a lot of government, a lot of investors. I mean, how are you seeing uh, uh, IFC uh, ready to change uh, PPP contracts or, or to, to, to make a different model of PPP contracts due to COVID uh, pandemic? Jacques, I think the, the contracts will certainly change. I think the issue of, of long-term contracts when you're you know, trying to write rules of a game for 30 years, uh, it's impossible to foresee everything. Um, and certainly no one could foresee COVID uh, a year and a half ago. Um, so I think the, more importantly, it's really the, the partnership between the, the public and the private partner, because at some point in time, you need to put the contract aside and uh, come to an agreement. So I think the concessions that have, um, you know, uh, survived, proceeded, are the ones where the government, as you've mentioned, provide support, whether it's specific to the airport or more general economic support, which has allowed these airports to proceed. So I think flexibility is, is key. I think we have seen a variety of COVID uh, conditions going into new contracts. Uh, so essentially uh, focusing on attempt to bake cost relief into COVID-19 delays. Uh, in other cases, attempting to, to contract out cost relief around COVID-19. So it essentially means you move change in law related to COVID-19 um, from change in law, which would give you time and, and cost relief to a natural force measure, which gives you time relief, but not uh, cost. Um, and in, in addition, I think one would also extend the time period for ongoing force measure before termination rights. Uh, a kick in. So I think this, this approach should keep concessionaire whole by extending the contract term so they can make up increased costs or loss of revenue on the back end. And often it's an approach the governments prefer because they don't need to put their hand into their pocket uh, and provide immediate support, but can give that relief to uh, concessionaires by extending the concession term. Thank you. Thank you, Ooh, Alexander. I mean, just for airport investors, I mean, what would you uh, expect? I mean, would you expect a longer term concession or even perpetual concession and more flexibility on investment programs and tariff regulation pattern on, or even traffic guarantees? Anke, tell me what is your, your wish? Well, I could make a long wish list, I can tell you. Um, but uh, to keep uh, this short, um, I think, yes, longer concessions uh, have been shown to work better than shorter term because, I mean, as I said before, airports are um, an industry that uh, 
knows their ups and downs. And uh, if you have a longer term, and I mean 30 year plus, I would classify as longer term, are better in that regard in order to ride out a storm and then um, uh, make sure that uh, you are not um, um, like uh, too much constrained by the time that you went into a concession and the time that you need to go out of the concession. So um, longer term helps. Uh, overall, I think flexibility is key and making sure that, um, well, you are not um, forced to invest just because the, um, it says in the contract you have to spend that amount of money or you have to do it by that year, but uh, making sure that um, it's appropriate and that means um, functional requirements are key, service levels are key, and as long as those are defined, I mean, the government should really get what they need, meaning a fully functional and uh, high quality airport. Um, and um, also it will help in implementing new technology if you don't have to invest a certain amount into a certain facility, but can make sure that you can achieve the service via the most technologi technologically advanced um, method. Um, and uh, so I think uh, these uh, should be the, the key terms in the contract, yeah. All right, thank you, Anke. David Olivier, your view. Uh, no, nothing to add, no, nothing to, add with, to, to what uh, Alexander and Anke have just said. I mean, we obviously are willing to have a uh, longer term concession because, uh, I mean, it, for sure, we will have several crises throughout a 30 year period. So we definitely need to have duration to average out, you know, the effect of, um, of, of cycles. So that's one, one thing. I think uh, what this crisis has put the emphasis on is definitely uh, the balance of power in the contract uh, between uh, uh, the force measure, uh, the, the economic rebalancing uh, clauses, um, uh, the regulatory, the economic regulatory framework, the relationship with airlines, uh, and definitely the flexibility we we've see, we had seen in the past uh, um, several concert, several PPP programs where. Um, um, fixed commitments were on the shoulders of the investors. And that's, that's obviously not only is, is not useful from a capacity point of view, but uh, sometimes it's an, an economic nonsense to invest in an infrastructure which is not needed. Uh, and, and so I, I think having more flexibility in uh, dealing with, with uh, SLA obligations or investment obligations, I, I think is very key. But I would say that beyond the contractual framework, what, what is really important for us now is to check on the behavioral the behavior of our counter, governmental counterparty uh, because contract is one thing but if the contract is not enforced uh, and we are in a 30 years relationship we need to make sure that we are dealing with a government that is willing to sit at the table to negotiate and make sure that uh, both parties uh, can actually survive uh, and and I think more than the contract I think the behavior the, the way they are treating, other concessions is very, very important. And we've seen obviously some variations from one country to, to the other. Uh, and, and so having a more partnership uh, approach, I think is very important for the long-term um, sustainability of, of, uh, of, of the, the PPP programs. Thank you. Thank you, David Olivier. Uh, well, you've been, you've been um, mentioning the, the governments. I, I, I mean, it's clear that PPP will remain maybe more than it was before. And unmissable and unmissable for governments to ensure the development of their airport infrastructure. Uh, I, I would like to ask Eve a, 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 a very simple question. I mean, Eve, do you see any government reluctance to accept new models for airport PPP contracts, including probably more protection, lower government remuneration, longer PPP duration? Are you are you seeing government interested in in, in, in this way of making uh, airport PPPs? Yeah, I, thank you. Uh, I. I think government will be more flexible in the future in view of what's happening. I don't agree with what has been said. Uh, one, one issue still, uh, which I think will be a problem is extending the duration of the contract. I think it's, we have all work with concession. You know, I always remember 30 years ago working on the uh, highway concession in Mexico, and you could extend the highway concession for 100 years, you would never solve the problem with the devaluation of the peso at that time. So extending uh, duration of concession is one way to do it, but I think we will have to work on a number of different ways to, uh, to, to address those issues. I think also as uh, 
uh, David Olivier said, which is I think very important, is really the government, you will look at government how they are behaving. And what I've seen the last few months in the very few transactions I'm working on is government has been fairly flexible and understanding that there is a game changer and that things that they could ask a few months ago, they will adapt it and change it. So well, thank you. Thank you, Yves. Uh, I, I would like to have your view, Alexander. You, you, you've been talking to a lot of governments. You, you are advising a lot of governments. I mean, how do you see governments uh, and facing this uh, COVID uh, pandemic and, and how they are envisaging new uh, PPP contracts, new, PP, new PPPs? So I see short-term caution, but you know, keeping in mind the journey to go from the concept to tender takes a certain time, and in some cases, you know, up to two years, um, two years of, of preparation. It certainly gives the government space to think through what they want to do, and, and it's not a bad thing. Um, so there are cases where the sanitary crisis is dominating all discussions. So airports are perhaps not the flavor of a month right now. I think that's really in the immediate future. I think if you look at certain regions, especially Asia, Asia Pacific, you have a massive amount of activity with high projected surges in, in traffic and creaking infrastructure. So there's definitely a need for private injections of capital. Um, and in some cases, you know, the local uh, CAs are trying to offload their operational activities as well. Um, and I, I think very strong realization of the conversations uh, I'm having in, in, with governments of a wider impact of airport development on the economy, on jobs, on growth, uh, you know, your countries like Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, et cetera, uh, all of which, all of whom have that realization. Um, and I think, you know, key is timing here. I think, as was mentioned, uh, going or tendering off uh, a long term concession right now with all the uncertainties around traffic, perhaps is something governments are kind of shying away from, but that is not preventing them from thinking through all the different options in terms of structuring how they want to tender it so that when the time comes, when things have settled down, uh, perhaps later this year, they'll be ready to go to the market. So I think in the, in the medium term, there's certainly a lot, a lot of appetite and behind the scenes, there's a lot of homework going on on the government side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Well, I mean, we, we, we have reached the, 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 the five o'clock uh, uh, deadline. I, I, I don't know if we, if we have time to, uh, to uh, answer to a couple of questions. I've seen, uh, I've seen many questions, many interesting questions, and uh, maybe Jean-Christophe, I mean, tell us about the uh, time limit. There's no time limitation. I mean, this discussion is super interesting. We hear about wish lists, we hear about uh, new emerging trends with government. So I think uh, let's have it go on. Uh, there's a couple of questions I see in the Q&A box. A couple of them have already been answered generously yeah. by Curtis. And um, should we not be able to cover everything now? I'm sure that our panelists will be happy to give written answers later. Yes, probably. What 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 I would suggest is that I mean I mean the panelists give give a direct answer. I mean uh, if they can answer on the uh, on the on the Q and A um, uh, question which are listed in the in the uh, in the application. We have, we have question about the renegotiation of airport concession. I mean. Uh, I mean, how they are they renegotiated? I mean, is it easy to renegotiate? Uh, we have question about the uh, adjustment between regulators and investors to help uh, to soften uh, concession commitments. Maybe if you could give a couple of words on that, I mean, to to end up with the consequence of uh, of COVID. I yeah, I think it's it's very difficult to give a generic answer to that question because, very frankly. Uh, negotiation have been, you know, concession by concession, state by state, countries by countries, and you don't have the same result in some countries compared to others. Some countries have been fairly flexible. Uh, some others have been very unflexible. We have been negotiate. We have had negotiation on force majeure. I mean, take the French government. The French government has decided to review the overall structure and uh, they, they are starting, I mean, they will start in the next few weeks in negotiation with the French airport. So it's really, it, it, it really depends on the contractual uh, obligation of its bodies and how the states 
uh, is ready to react. Uh, it's quasi impossible to answer your question, very frankly. Yes, I, I, I know. I've seen I've seen governments being flexible and government not being flexible. Uh, yes, but I mean, I think that government should also understand that it's a public-private partnership. You have the word partnership, and then uh, when you have to face a crisis like COVID, I mean, you need to sit around the table and find solution. Uh, well, we have other questions which are in relation with SDGs, uh, environmental issues, impact on traffic. Well. I, I just like to, to, to tell everyone that we will have a, a sequence of a webinar on the, the airport chapter that the next one will be dedicated to airport concession and SDGs and ESGs. So you will be all informed about that. I mean, within a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit more. And this webinar will be held probably end of May or, or during the month of, of June. So, well, Thank you, thank you to all panelists. Thank you for the uh, the, the attendees, and maybe uh, Jean Christophe, if you want to wrap up this uh, webinar. With pleasure. Uh, just maybe a note that there will also be a webinar on the fifteenth of April on how to build uh, more collaborative PPPs uh, with dispute avoidance, and that ties in perfectly into this partnership partnering approach. How to you know use make use of dispute boards to avoid. Uh, you know, complicated situations that are unexpected and hardships to really turn out to be uh, massive extensions of time, massive, uh, you know, claims uh, being uh, done there. Because if you level it out on the long term, such a such a PPP is actually a pretty good uh, scheme to make sure that both partners can can uh, deliver something that is good for the people and delivering PPPs that are good for the people and delivering value for the future is our cause at WAP. And so we're very impressed by the number of professionals who have joined for this WAP webinar today. Uh, it stayed constantly at very high levels. And we thank you to have taken the time to participate in this interesting, uh, for your interesting questions that you have addressed to our exceptional panelists. Thank you very much. It was a really high quality round table. We will shortly publish a short summary of today's webinar on the WAP.org website. And should you want to be posted and stay posted on the latest developments in public-private partnerships, you may want to follow WAP's LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, or YouTube presence. We invite you to share your PPP-specific updates on the WAP blog and in your weekly newsletter, the PPP Times. And if you want to be proactively involved in promoting and developing public-private partnerships in this field of airport PPPs or in other asset classes, we simply encourage you to become part of the WAP family. Thank you very much. And this concludes today's roundtable on airport PPPs. Thank you. Thank you for having us.